Okay, so the topic of this video are one of the categories of organic molecules called proteins. Now there's four types of organic molecules, proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, and nucleic acids. I have a separate video for each. This video is, is devoted to proteins. So let's get started. So a few basics first about proteins. First of all, proteins are used in a wide variety of cellular functions. You know, later in the school year, we're going to go into photosynthesis in a lot more detail. But from the animation, you can see that photosynthesis requires three basic reactants, sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water. And through the process of photosynthesis, we'll create oxygen and glucose. But in order to make oxygen and glucose, very special proteins are required along the way. We'll go into that in more detail. Here's another example where proteins are used in cellular functions. The mitochondria does a process called cellular respiration. The, cell, the mitochondria is an organelle part of your cell, and its, its job is to take in glucose and produce a molecule called ATP. It's an energy molecule. So later on in the school year, we'll learn about this in more detail. Later on in the school year, we're going to learn about a process called DNA replication. This is the process where one DNA molecule is copied into two DNA molecules. This process requires the use of proteins. So another example of a cell process that requires proteins is a process called transcription. And in this process, RNA is created. Now in my picture, there's DNA. There are special proteins that will break apart a DNA molecule. And then these orange RNA molecules will attach to the DNA. Once that happens, the orange RNA will break away and eventually will tell you what it does in another video, but there are special proteins that will join the DNA back together. So there's all kinds of needs for proteins. And the last one I want to quickly mention, later on in the school year, we're going to learn about a cellular process called translation. In this process, a ribosome is going to make proteins with the help of various, uh, with the help of uh, of other kinds of proteins called enzymes. So a ribosome is going to gather an amino acid and another and another and another and another and another and another and it's going to link these amino acids into a big long chain. And that's what a protein is, a big chain of, of amino acids. But all of these processes require proteins. And so um, I brought up earlier in another video monomers and polymers. If you recall that a monomer is a small organic molecule, and in the world of proteins, we call the monomer of a protein an amino acid. Now, there's, uh, there's 20 different kinds of amino acids. For instance, leucine is one of the 20 different kinds of amino acids. Valine is another. Glycine is another. Alanine is another. And so here's four different amino acids. Uh, and, but like I said a moment ago, there's 20 different kinds of amino acids. So when a bunch of amino acids bond together into a big long chain, we call this a polypeptide. So this big long chain of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, this big long chain of 10 amino acids right here makes up one single polypeptide. Polypeptide is a large organic molecule made from smaller amino acids. Well, proteins are going to be formed from a collection of polypeptides. So here in green is another polypeptide. This polypeptide is a little smaller. You can see it's only made from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven amino acids. Now, uh, my, my notes say that proteins are formed from a collection of polypeptides. So watch this. These two polypeptides will bond together, and then when they attach, they're going to twist and fold themselves into a very specific shape. And then, and only then, do we call that overall molecule a protein. So proteins are made from maybe only one polypeptide. Other proteins are made from two polypeptides. Other proteins are made from three polypeptides. Other proteins are made from four polypeptides. So proteins can be rather large. And so it's this exact arrangement of amino acids that will determine what type of protein it is and what the job does. If one single amino acid is changed and in the wrong location, that really can have drastic impacts on the overall protein. You might have heard, you might have heard of a disease called sickle cell disease. 
because of one single wrong protein, excuse me, because of one single wrong amino acid, uh, red blood cells are misshapen. They almost look like bananas in people who have sickle cell disease. So it can be a very life-threatening disease, all because of the wrong placement of a single amino acid. So when we look at the amino acid structure, the molecular structure, well, it's organic, and so you know that there's going to be a central carbon atom. So there's our central carbon, carbon atom flashing. Attached to carbon, remember in another video we said that carbon can bond up to four different times. So we're going to have four different uh, uh, molecules or four different, excuse me, four different atoms are going to be bonded to this one carbon here in the center. So on the left in my animation, we have the first group I want to mention. This three atom group right here, this NH2 group, is what we call an amino group. NH2 is, is what we call an amino group, and amino acids have an amino group. They also, notice attached to the carbon, also is a single hydrogen. All 20 amino acids have a single hydrogen. The next thing I want to mention, all 20 amino acids have this COOH group called a carboxyl group. And I hope you see how it got the name carboxyl. Carb implies carbon, oxyl implies oxygen. So if you just mush the word carbon and oxygen together, you get a carboxyl. All amino acids have a carboxyl group. And the last thing, the last atom that's attached to our central carbon is what we simply just call the R group, or you, or you might even see it called the side group. Now, R does not really stand for anything on the periodic table. Uh, the joke is that it just stands for the rest of the molecule. And what I mean by that, there's 20 different amino acids, but every single one, every amino acid has a different R group, has a different group of molecules right here where it says the letter R. And I'll show you a few examples right now. So here we have our very generic diagram that I just shown, and I highlighted the R group in red. Now there's an amino acid by the name of glycine. Its R group is simply a hydrogen atom. That's it. So the R group can be very simple, like in the example of glycine right here. Well, let me put the generic diagram of an amino acid back up here. Here we have our R group, a very generic amino acid diagram. Now, there's another, there's another amino acid by the name of alanine. Its R group looks like this, a carbon and three hydrogens. But notice how everything else is the same when you compare alanine to the previous example. Here's one more example. So let's reset the amino acid to our generic structure with the R group highlighted in red. There's an amino acid by the name of valine. Its R group is a little more complex. You can see right here what its R group looks like. But notice the rest of the amino acid is unchanged. It still has the NH2 amino group. It still has the COOH carboxyl group. The only thing different between valine and the previous two examples is they have a different R group. And so here's four of the 20 amino acids that exist, serine, glycine, alanine, and valine. And my question on top says, what differs between these four amino acids? Notice they each have an amino group, NH2. That's the same. Serine's amino group is the same as glycine, alanine, and valine. Notice they each have, highlighted in red color here, they each have a carboxyl group. Serine's carboxyl group is the same as glycine, same as alanine, same as valine. So what makes these four different is their R group. This, is, uh, this highlighted in green here is our R group of these four different amino acids. So how do amino acids bond? I said a moment ago that that a polypeptide is made from many, 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 many amino acids. And in reality, one single chain of polypeptide might be made from hundreds and hundreds and thousands of amino acids. So how do those amino acids bond together? Well, earlier in another video, I introduced you to a chemical reaction called a dehydration synthesis reaction. And so watch, here's two amino acids in my animation here. With the addition of, uh, excuse me, with the removal of water, with the removal of water, this is why it's called a dehydration reaction, because water is removed. With the removal of water, 
those two amino acids have bonded together. What holds them together is a bond called a peptide bond. That's why a big chain of amino acids is called a polypeptide. So a peptide bond is what links amino acids together. You see there's a peptide bond in between the carbon on the left and the nitrogen on the right. And so polypeptide bonds, or excuse me, the, uh, the polypeptides the big chain, remember a big chain of amino acids is called a polypeptide. The polypeptide will bend and fold and twist because the R group of one amino acid is attracted to the R group of another. And when they attract to one another, they bend and it twists and folds the entire chain. So my, uh, the opposite of a dehydration synthesis reaction. Here we have two amino acids bonded together to make one uh, one, for instance, very small polypeptide. But how would this, how would these two amino acids that are bonded together right now, how would they be broken down? Well, there is what's called a hydrolysis reaction. And with the addition of water, when water is added with the help of a type of protein called enzyme also. So water and enzymes are going to help to break apart those two. So that peptide bond is broken with the help of water and a type of molecule called an enzyme, which we're going to talk more about later in this video. So this occurs during the digestion of our food. You know, when we take in food, our, our, our body, our digestive system will break our food, break proteins, for instance, down into smaller amino acids, which can be used for energy. So as I wrap up this video, I want to give special attention to a category of protein called enzymes. So enzymes are a type of protein. Now in my picture, I have a, a, a big chain of glucose right here. So there's four glucoses bonded together to make one big molecule. For instance, this might be starch, a polysaccharide called starch. But uh, enzymes, what their job is, and, and there are thousands of different uh, types of enzymes, but enzymes' job in general is to lower the energy that is needed to start a chemical reaction. So the reason why we have enzymes is when cells uh, perform their cellular jobs and cells do their functions, if we did not have enzymes, cells would need a lot more energy to achieve their needs, to achieve their goals. So with the use of enzymes, cellular needs are performed a lot more efficiently. They lower the energy needed to start a chemical reaction. So for instance, one example where enzymes are required is simply the digesting and breaking down of food. Again, in my picture, pretend that's a molecule of starch made from four glucoses bonded together. Well, there's an enzyme by the name of amylase. Amylase is, is uh, shown here, symbolic of the animated scissors. Now, I can tell just by the spelling of the word amylase that amylase is an enzyme. Enzymes typically end with the suffix A-S-E. So if I, if I see a molecule with the suffix ending of A-S-E, good chance that that molecule is an enzyme. And so what amylase will do will break that four glucose molecule into two smaller fragments. That's what I mean by breaking down food. So when you take in large food molecules, the enzyme called amylase will break it, break that large food molecule into smaller fragments. So another use of enzymes, not only do they break down food, but another use of enzymes is that they help build molecules such as proteins. Now we saw this a moment ago, or a few moments ago, the process of dehydration synthesis. Here we have two amino acids, and in order to bond them together to build up a polypeptide, which could then make a protein, two amino acids will join together and water will be removed. Now, what, what I didn't show in the animation are various enzymes that help to break those original chemical bonds. And so with the removal of water and the action of various enzymes, those two amino acids have been bonded together to make a larger, this would be a very small polypeptide if it only consisted of two amino acids, but you could then have a third amino acid bond together and then a fourth amino acid, then a fifth amino acid. So enzymes also build up molecules. Enzymes are very sensitive to their environment. So enzymes work really, really well when the enzyme is in its 
normal environment. But enzymes are very sensitive to pH. Enzymes are very sensitive to body temperature. So in my example, if you have a high fever, enzymes lose their ability to work. Now, right now, a person has pretend a, a normal body temperature of 98.6 degrees. And so that enzyme called amylase does its job just fine. It will break apart those, uh, those four glucose that grouping of four glucose, it broke apart into those two fragments. And that's its job. It worked wonderfully. However, let's pretend a person has a fever of 102.5 degrees. So notice how the enzyme is not, the scissors are not animated. They're not cutting anymore. So what happens is when enzymes are outside of their normal temperature, they lose their ability to function. So because the enzymes aren't cutting, there's no chemical reaction. And so if the body temperature is not brought back down to normal, then uh, cell reactions stop functioning and, and cells start to die and overall the person could die. Another thing I want to mention is that enzymes are very specific in their actions. Again, here's that molecule of starch made from those four glucoses bonded together. And there's the same amylase animation we saw a moment ago. The enzyme called amylase, it's very, very specific. It will break that four glucose molecule called starch into those two smaller fragments. And it does that wonderfully. But watch this. So look at this example. The molecules changed a little bit. It used to be glucose, 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 glucose. Four glucose is binded together. But now there's a couple fructoses where there used to be glucoses. Amylase, notice how the scissors are not cutting. Amylase is not able to break these uh, molecules down. Amylase is very, very specific. There would have to be another different enzyme to break apart what you see in the picture because amylase just can't do it. So because amylase can't cut right there, there's no chemical reaction. The only way there would be a chemical reaction is if there was a separate new enzyme that was capable to break down that molecule in the picture. But amylase sure can't do it. And lastly, I want to mention that enzymes are reusable. And what I mean by that, here we have two starches, a starch on the left, those four glucoses bonded together, a starch on the right, those four glucoses bonded together. And so what I mean by the reusable, here's our enzyme amylase. It will break down the first starch, but what I mean by it's reusable, it can also be used to break down that other starch. And if there's more, the enzyme can be used to break down a third starch, break down a fourth starch. So again, this helps to save energy. Instead of having to build amylase over and over and over and over and over again, one amylase molecule can be used, I don't want to say indefinitely, but can be used many, many, many times. And so there you go. We've reached the end. If you're in my biology class, pause the video. I'd love to check your, try these answers or try these questions on a separate sheet of paper. I'd love to check your answers either before school or after school one day. Good luck.